Showtime. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Please join me. <clears throat> join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please call the roll. Present. Director Raderman. Here. President Here. Director Thomas. Here. Here. Uh, item number two on the agenda is public comment. This time members of the public may address the board of any non-agendized item. The public is encouraged to work through staff to place items on the agenda, agenda for board consideration. No action can be taken on matters not listed on the agenda. Comments are limited to those to three minutes per person. Is there any public comment today? Seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Following items are expected to be routine, non-controversial. The items will be acted upon by the board at one time without discussion. Any board member may request that the items be removed for later discussion. Uh, item 3A, approval of minutes from October 4th, 11th, and October 25th. Item 3B, review of board directors monthly timesheets. And 3C, approval of claim summary number 548. Can I have a motion? And move for approval of the consent agenda, please. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. <clears throat> we'll move on to new business, review uh, and direction of the fiscal year 2018. 1718 first quarter investment report. Mr. Meyer. The most interesting man in the world. <laughs> oh. Is that a dig at my attempt at a beard? <laughs> oh, it's a compliment. A compliment. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that's, something that, that's something that county people never hear. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> coming, coming hard. Maybe the highlight your career. I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> can't make them that easy for me, guys. No, no, no. It's going to be hard to follow that. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, Mr. President, members of the board. The item before you is rather dated because it's the first quarter investment report from July 1 through September 30th and it is November 8th. However, because of the timing of meetings and finance committee, it is before you today. Um, I'm just going to go over a few highlights of the change in position as far as our cash is concerned, cash and investments. I'm not going to really go over any economic indicators because again, this is all da dated. Uh, if you look at page one, we did show a decrease of a little over $1.1 million in cash and investments for the quarter ended September 30th. The reason for this is the first quarter is always the, first, the quarter where we pay principal and interest on in our bonds and loans. It's that principal amount that really drives up our costs in that first quarter. And that's where the majority of the cash outflow is, um, in addition to just our regular expenses. But that's the bulk of it. We had a CDRs that matured. We, had, we moved money into our uncle bank account because, again, we had to write our checks and transfer it out for that debt service payment. So that, takes care, that kind of explains why we had a negative uh, change in, in cash and investments. If you go to the second page in the top uh, paragraph, we did have our uh, Final disbursement from 1617 county tax uh, property taxes. That's our supplemental tax. That's why you only see $250,000 in there. The majority comes in January and in May. Um, the debt service that I've mentioned was about $1.8 million, a little bit more than one8 So again, that shows you that where the large main outflow of cash is. 
But on the good note of that, we paid off the 2013 refunding bond loan. So that was paid, the last principal and interest payment was made on that particular uh, loan. One of the things we keep doing is taking a look at different investment opportunities. Um, LAFE right now has been very good to us. As of September 30th, it was 1.11%. It's up to about 1.16, much better than we can get on a number of instruments out there, especially if we look at CDs or something similar to that, because we got to lock in for a, a predetermined amount of time, whether it's six months, 12 months, two years. Things are changing, uh, as you're aware. Uh, the president has chosen a new Fed chairman for next year, but from what I read and hear about him, it's pretty much going to stay the course as what Janet Yellen had set forth. There, so we're going to see small incremental increases in the Fed funds rates, which will drive interest rates up slowly. So I'm afraid to lock into a lot of long-term investments when I know the interest rates are going up. But we're still doing well, especially with the investments that we do have, and I don't think we're at jeopardy at uh, any losses. Speaking of which, I know this is supposed to focus on July 1 through September 30th. Last week, I believe it was, we received another distribution on the Lehman Brothers uh, bankruptcy. It was only a little over $12,000, but we're up to 44% recovery now which we were offered anywhere from 15 to 20, mid-20s several years back. So I don't anticipate significant uh, more distributions, but at 44%, we're doing fairly good. With that, I'll open it to any questions. Okay, we had a um, uh, maturation, and you had put money in one of the accounts, and you were gonna be looking for investment. Yes. And what happened to that? We're, we're still mainly into C, uh, I'm sorry, into late. Late. I haven't seen anything out there that justifies the risk of going longer term because most of the investments we're going to be looking at is two or three years. And even if I go out a year and a half, it's 125, whereas I'm getting 116 with late. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the risk reward just isn't there at this point. I do anticipate seeing uh, more opportunities. And if we look at the municipal bond market on the secondary market, you're paying such a premium. Even though the stated yield could be 5%, you're paying such a premium to buy it, it drives down the yield to where we are right now, 125 to 150, depending upon the length. Okay, my next question is, where are you on looking for an investment advisor? Unfortunately, things haven't progressed that much because I've been doing other items, uh, but that's on my list to do before the end of the year. Okay. Jeff, my Roth IRA is 24% gain this year, man. Um, let's see. Uh, so I figured the district can, what, 15 to 20% gain? You're into equities. Yeah, that's the thing. We can't we touch can. that market. We can't touch it. We're prescribed by state and yeah. district investment policies. And those are prohibited. So you're, you're happy, I mean, seeing how those, uh, that market or that industry has behaved, um, you're okay, you're comfortable where we are with the limitations that we have? I think so. I, I, obviously, I'd like to see more, but safety, liquidity, and yeah. yield. Yeah. And we, we've got right. to look for that. However, on the flip side of that, that equities market is helping our retiree health portfolio. Uh, so I was curious how, if there was any relation. So. Yeah, and they're upwards to seven to seven and a half percent return. Yeah. And they're still bounded by restrictions as to what they can invest in, but they're doing, they have a better ability than we do. All right. <clears throat> is there anything else? Is there action on this, just to accept, or is there action? Uh, to receive and file. By motion. Do we need a motion? No. Okay. No. All right. Anything else regarding this? Anything from the public? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. We'll move on to 4B. Just uh, designate district voting representative at Aqua Fall Conference. 
Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Before I start, I just want to recognize a, a friend and colleague of mine, uh, Tim Hildebrand. Tim is a uh, manager with CalNet, and he's also a, a, a member with me of the uh, Leadership Calaveras class uh, this year. And one of our assignments is to attend a, uh, a public meeting uh, like, like this one. So uh, he's, he's uh, hopefully it's, he's getting an education of some kind. So hopefully it's productive. But thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. Great guy, and uh, it's been a really, really great uh, experience being a part of that. Uh, th this is pretty straightforward. We've got the, uh, the next conference, the Aqua Conference, uh, coming up in a few weeks. We have a, the uh, uh, consideration of, of appointing the next uh, chair and vice, uh, yeah, pre president, is president or vice, yeah, president and vice president of Aqua. And uh, the nominating committee of Aqua has moved forward with uh, a uh, recommendation for Brent Hasty from Yuba County Water Agency to be the next president. Brent is a, currently the vice president. And then uh, Steve Lamar from Irvine Ranch Water District is the next vice president. Uh, this board has supported both of those nominees. They're outstanding uh, people and, and uh, just couldn't find better, better people for those positions. But with that, I very much hope that we'll be able to uh, cast a ballot in support of their nomination. And so this is to formally go through that process so that the board has someone at the meeting who is, who is authorized to, uh, to do that. I would recommend that it be a board member. Uh, and if you'd like to, uh, and I'd also recommend that we, that we also, it's not expressly part of the, the request, but I think it would be, be a good idea to add as an alternate as well, um, another board member as an alternate in case for whatever reason, if somebody's sick or, or can't be there. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll uh, ask the board to, uh, uh, to make that uh, determination who should serve as. Uh. Um, a question to the board, who, who all is, is going to be attending? I'll be going. Well, I'll be there. Bertha? No? Yeah. I will be. Okay. <clears throat> well, I'd, um, I'd who's, prefer who's, to be uh, Dave and then an alternate uh, of the board, but um, it's whatever, whatever you guys think. Are you interested in, in, in casting the vote, Russ? <clears throat> Not particularly. Uh, the reason being is I, uh, there are people that will be there, the board members that are, um, you know, for, uh, have, have more familiarity with that group than I do. I, sure. should be somebody I can do it, uh, unless, you know, the general manager's fine, or if we want to see a board member from our agency do it. I have no... No qualms or reservations. Well, <clears throat> Jeff has said he'd like to see the general manager do it. General manager said he'd like to see a board member do it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I've done it before. Yeah. I'm happy to. I'm happy to do it. But uh, you know, I mean, it's. I'll go ahead and do it. Well, it's something yeah. different. It, what's the What's the time constraint? I mean, is it going to conflict with anything else? I mean, when is this? When one, is, uh, one thirty, I think, on. Uh, well, you'll be, Terry will just be obligated to do it if he's, and then Dave could be the alternate. Uh, okay. That, that would work. Okay. That would that's be. My, yeah. That's my. I move. Uh, Jerry, okay. see, so cast the vote and uh, General Manager uh, Egerton to uh, be the alternate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We have a motion. Good. Well, under discussion, does anybody else want to do a campaign for for, for the, you know, alternate? No. You want to do it? No, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be just fine. And, and I don't expect there's going to be any any other nominees, but these two gentlemen. Um, yeah. They're in the rare rare occasion someone gets nominated from the floor. Uh, but given the uh, outpouring of support and unanimity of, of great feeling about these two people, I don't, I don't see that happening. Well, as part of this discussion, there's also voting that takes place on Monday uh, for the JPA. Uh, I won't be there to, to vote. Oh, that's Do right. you have that vote? Um, yes, because I'm already the designated alternative, okay. and I plan to be there. So okay. um, you right. bet. Yeah, <clears throat> I'll, I'll do that. Looking at the schedule, uh, fellow directors, uh, Wednesday is, is wide open for me, so I shouldn't have any trouble. Okay, that. great. All right, we have a motion and a second. Um, is there any discussion from the public? Uh, who did second? Um, Russ seconded, I believe. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Okay, we'll move to 4C, information discussion regarding update of uh, district employment policies. Stacy Lawler. Good afternoon. Uh, today I'm here to present um, section 4000 and section 7000 of the proposed uh, new employee policy handbook. Um, these cover the areas of hours, meals, rest periods in section 4000 
and leaves in section 7000 which um, this a lot of this is um, law that is um, that we're required to follow um, and it just updates um, our current practices and procedures um, that the district has been conducting for quite some time um, all these policies have been again vetted through the uh, union as well as management and confidential group and we've um, taken all their comments and incorporated them and felt necessary um, and we only have two more sections to go and <laughs> can bring this back hopefully and have a new policy handbook i again applaud you for doing this and it's, it's a <laughs> tedious tedious yeah. process what i'd like to do the same thing that i've done before is just kind of hit the highlights of what any major changes are in these two sections <clears throat> um, the only uh, major changes are we did add rest and meal periods which we didn't have previous and this again has um, a, a lot of it is the same as what is in current mous um, also we have a timekeeping we added timekeeping we we added an on-call policy and a pregnancy disability leave policy which is required by the state but no changes to our practices and procedures so is 7000.5 brand new correct okay and so all we did was bring the state policy and incorporate it into our manual correct That's well, it was interesting to see things like the bone marrow or organ donor leave and stuff. It's like, mm -hmm. wow, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Every few years, it seems like they add a different type of leave. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, at least they're keeping up with it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is there anything else from the board? And once again, this is just for us to recognize and accept. Oh, Great. Yep. Bruce Ponder. Okay, <laughs> consider it pondered. So my goal is hopefully the first quarter of next year we'll have a brand new policy or a whole handbook for you guys to uh, adopt. Will we get new binders? <laughs> <laughs> you will get a replacement of all those policies. Thanks for the hard what, work. Uh, I, I do have one, one question that I'm a little unclear of and maybe I didn't read it as well, but what type of uh, paternity leave? That 7,000.5, I see the uh, the pregnancy disability stuff. I, I didn't specifically see, you know, paternity type of leave for the husband having to go or... That's considered Family Medical Leave Act, which is uh, FMLA and the California Family Rights Act. So it's FMLA and CFRA. Within that leave, um, um, uh, the father is able to... Uh, take time to bond with the child and it's up to 12 weeks and that's what that covers um, we are not because we don't have a state disability we're not covered under paid family leave so all employees who take that leave must take use their PTO during that time so it's not covered under the pregnancy disability leave because that's the person who's pregnant right but the spouse of that person who's pregnant that's going through that there is no leave for them in that type, other than the family? Uh, not under the PDL, the pregnancy disability leave, okay. under the FMLA and CFRA, there is leave for them. Okay, yeah. thank you. Welcome. Anything else, anything further? <clears throat> um, Mr. Chairman, before we go on to 4D, um, I'd, I'd like to take a two minute break right, and talk to uh, our general manager about a procedural item that okay. uh, is of concern to me. All okay. right. Anything further regarding this item? Anything from the public? Okay. Thank you, Stacey. We'll take a short break. <laughs> Make it a minute and a half. coming into the uh, east, uh, uh, eastern San Joaquin groundwater, so maybe there's some... My thunder. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Not that easy to get rid of. Uh, we'll be back in. Okay, we'll uh, come back into order. Uh, we will 
Uh, begin to discuss 4D discussion action regarding approval of amended uh, and restated east side eastern San Joaquin groundwater sustainability agency MOU allowing Calabarce County to enter in as a member agency. So, so this is something we've talked about in concept in the past is that the county was wholly interested in getting joining the GSA at some point. Um, however, the timelines ex required that the district and the other agencies of the GSA file by the June 30th deadline of this year. Um, we have asked our council to develop a amended MOU, uh, which is the governance document for the Groundwater Sustainability Agency uh, to allow for the inclusion of Calaveras County uh, government as part of that Groundwater Sustainability <coughs> Agency. Um, this is the vessel, this, this amended and restated MOU for them to join. Uh, the only things that change is just, you know, inclusion of language that allows for Calaveras County to become a member. And then also there was a change associated with the voting requirements that just basically made it a majority uh, vote um, because going from three agencies to four uh, created a possibility of having, you know, an issue on that. So, um, and then just essentially what will happen is at this point, uh, Calaveras County has taken action by their board to accept this MOU as it is. Uh, we have done so as well. Uh, I'm working right now with uh, Stanislaus County and Rock Creek Water District to do the same. I actually provided them all of these documents that I developed for the board packet today so that they can just kind of salvage whatever they get out of that and move forward with their board actions as well. Um, so the recommendation today uh, before you is just to uh, pass the resolution um, allowing the general manager to sign the amended and restated MOU which allows Calaveras County to become a member agency of the Groundwater Sustainability Agency, Eastside Groundwater Sustainability Agency. All right. Is there anything further on this? <clears throat> I'd like to hear from uh, Russ on this before uh, your, your opinions and uh, recommendations. Well, I, um, it, it's, it's pretty obvious that, that uh, we should approach this from a standpoint of uh, solidarity within our county. I'm glad that uh, the county uh, board of supervisors has decided to, to you know, go ahead and, and join this uh, GSA. Um, I, I'm, I've said this before, I, I don't want to beat it to death, but we, we have a, a pretty good group represented there and adding the county will even add to the depth of it. Um, it was a, I'll report later about an interesting meeting that we had today. Um, but um, I, hmm? that's your guess. That's no, a guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I, I would uh, recommend that we um, authorize this uh, or move this this item forward. And, and I'm pre make a motion I am prepared to make a motion to that effect. Yes. Okay, okay and I'll second that. Okay. We have a, a motion by Director Thomas and a second by Director Nyman. Any other discussion? I uh, would just like to know who is going to be representing the county. What board member, or do they have board member and an alternate? Or yeah, so um, the county when they took their action, they signed uh, Supervisor Mills to act as their representative on the Need? Groundwater Sustainability Agency. Uh -huh. Yeah, so. He, uh, but he does not, so there's two, two agencies here, obviously. Our local groundwater sustainability agency, which is made up of the Calabrese right. entities plus the Stanislaus entities, and then the JPA um, representatives have already been chosen. So um, Russ is our uh, lead uh, on the JPA down for the entire basin, and Stanislaus County has a alternate. Uh, as the way the MOU is written right now. So. And, and the county has acknowledged in their action that, that uh, CCWD is, is the lead agency f in, within our group. Correct, yeah. yeah. So, so, so uh, explain to me then their concern of creating an overlap filing that conflicted with East Side GSA. Yes, so um, pursuant to the regulations of Sigma, um, what you have is you had to file um, a basically a, a filing is what they called it and it's a package of documentation that sets the boundaries of all the groundwater sustainability agencies um, and so since CCWD technically our boundaries according to the charter of when we were created is the entire 
County. Uh, and so if Calaveras County was to file at the same time, a se like a secondary filing, it would have created what they called an overlap. Okay. And then yeah. and then the entire basin could have been thrown into what they call probationary status until that was resolved. Wow. So it was, it was important, and, and this was partially uh, by our own counsel and advice is to make sure when you put your letter in, you say you're not trying to create an overlap. Um, you just want to join and, and that, that the, you intend to, to form a groundwater statement agency uh, with all these agencies where there's no boundary overlap. So it's, it's really um, strictly within the context of boundaries. Um, you could have, and this happened at one point, and it was a big deal and in, in San Joaquin County, there was, there was a bunch of these little water agencies that were filing uh, as groundwater sustainability agencies uh, at this rapid fire pace with um, no real concern for where the boundaries lied. Right. And then you had people filing over each other and then the county went ahead and made a filing across the entire county, okay. which immediately put all of the uh, agencies within San Joaquin County into what they called overlap conditions. Yeah. And so it required that there was a side agreement amongst all these agencies that they all said, these are the boundaries and you know, we agree. And that was how they dealt with that issue over there. Okay. So, so this would essentially reduce the concern that we've got uh, the, the Board of Supervisors competing for water management stuff in this county uh, that might be in conflict with what we're doing. Maybe not, but could be potentially in conflict with some of our plans if I, you know, as we look out into the future. Sure, and, and also um, I see a good role. This was kind of one of the things we had talked about in the past. Um, when it really comes to implementation and enforcement actions, it, it's not a comfortable position for CCWD to be in when right. it comes to groundwater pumping um, since they technically have the authority. And then also um, when it comes to land use planning, which is an element of this uh, action and plan, Mm -hmm. um, it would be good to have the agency that has that role in the county have a say uh, in that discussion um, instead of CCWD making those decisions for them. Yeah, okay, thank you. Excuse me, I had another question. You said this one took or overrode all of those other little uh, the associations? San no, in San Joaquin County, yeah. Because. We were involved in one not too long ago, wasn't it? Further down at the border uh, with Stanislaw? Um, so, yes, yeah, so we, we filed jointly and, and for the areas covered um, by, it's un, well, I guess the areas that were not covered in Stanislaus County. So there are agencies that filed in Stanislaus County, Oakdale Irrigation District being one of them. And, and so Stanislaus County, is covering the areas not covered already by Oakdale Irrigation District. So. Because there was a little water district. Oh, Rock Creek, Rock Creek. Yeah, water district. Yeah, yes. That one was. Water. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so they their jurisdictional boundary is, is included in, in our filing. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? Any discussion from the public? Secretary, please call the roll. Yes. Director yes. Yes. Thomas? Yes. 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 Okay, we'll move on to uh, update on uh, water storm disasters, FEMA reimbursement projects. Teresa? Yes, good afternoon, Mr. President, Board of Directors. Um, I provided you some hard copies of my PowerPoint presentation because after I put it together, some of my slides you're not going to be able to read, so you can follow along. <clears throat> Basically, I wanted to kind of give you an update on what transpired and on the work that we had to do that was involved with FEMA and applying for all these projects that we submitted to them for our disaster relief. Okay. Um, CCWD set up, once the disaster happened, we had that situation up at White Pines where we had the washout. We took a proactive approach because based on, you know, the fires that we had the other year, the year before, that we set up a project account and that got sent out to all of our staff. 
Okay. <clears throat> Am I too loud? No. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> it's me, my knees are knocking. <laughs> <laughs> it could be a flicker, a red shafted flicker. <laughs> so anyway, we just set up an account so we could follow um, our staff's time and, and um, their equipment. So that went out to the whole staff. So anybody that was doing any type of, it didn't matter so we could break it down, but any type of disaster relief or any type of emergencies, we could easily find it when it came time to apply for FEMA. So after that, FEMA, you know, required all the entities to attend an applicant's briefing for potential applicants of the presidentially declared um, disaster. We, we had several people in our staff attend. And after that, you guys, you know, we submitted the form 9049, giving Dave and I permission, you know, to file. And the board approved that back in March. <clears throat> That's for the request for the public assistance. Um, after, so then all this starts rolling up and district staff met, we had to discuss all our projects. So everybody came to the table bringing everything that happened in the disaster so we could have something to present to FEMA when they came out to visit. And so as, as that happened, FEMA did come out, their, their program specialists met with us um, and we gave them our, our, our list of projects, that's what they call them. And based on that list of projects, that's the FEMA category. So the categories you have is like debris removal from some of the flash floods. You have emergency, you know, protective measures. That's our generators, you know, when they're running because power outages and so forth. We have roads and bridges, and we all know about those. Uh, water control facilities, buildings and equipment, utilities, parks and rec. So there's a whole list down here of what you need to look at and qualify and some of them. Some of these projects qualify for more than one. And, you know, really, this is just to give you, give you kind of a, a sense of what goes into these, to this kind of, uh, the effort to get reimbursed for the, the costs associated with the declared disaster. And, and really, it, it is an incredible amount of work that uh, Teresa took the lead on and staff from many other departments, finance and, and other operations and others. Know. And engineering that, that really spent a lot of time and effort to make this happen. Uh, in fact, it's an interesting note. I've talked to uh, I talked to someone uh, who happens to be the parent of a, of a friend of my son, and, and it turns out she was actually working under a contract uh, with uh, one of the irrigation districts to do a temporary provide support uh, for this very purpose. She was actually hired as a temporary employee just to do all of the the work associated with. Uh, preparing and filing the application for FEMA reimbursement for the, disaster, the same disaster uh, events that we were dealing with. So really, uh, really proud of all the effort that uh, Teresa and everybody put in to, in to make this happen. It's, uh, you know, it's, again, it's one of those things, be, it, it's great to see the money come in at the end, but there is uh, a lot of time and effort to make that happen. So from this particular category, um, we come into the project worksheet and basically when we're sitting down with FEMA at the table, all this is put in by, by hand. So we're all writing it in by hand and then trying to justify and they're asking us questions to make sure that the projects that we're listing are applicable and meet their, meet their, their standards. So we do that. <clears throat> And then, Teresa, and the, and the staff that you deal with, those are actually circuit riders, basically, right? I mean, those people are, are it's not, as, not like other FEMA staff who might be like in the environmental review unit who are housed, say, in, in Oakland. These are, these are staff that move wherever in the country there is, a, there is right. a disaster to respond to. So part of the challenge was it, with, with all of the, the hurricanes, as those unfolded uh, in, the, in, the, in the south, there was a, a, a real push to get all of this done even faster because the FEMA staff were having to, to mobilize and pick up and move out. So. And really what pushed ours to the forefront is because one, we were proactive. We got the, you, the board, voted and gave us permission to proceed in a timely fashion. So we were first on the list. Okay, so yeah, they were here for us and it was, it was, it was work and it was, and they were on there like with their, their whips because they had to move on to other disasters. Um, <clears throat> so you get the list of projects, and so in that list of projects, you're looking at your damage description. You're looking at, was the work completed during this time of the disaster, or is there further work to, to be done? And then you, the detailing your labor and your equipment. 
because part of your equipment can be paid for and some of your equipment can be paid for as well as normal working hours and then as well as after hours. And so <clears throat> with that labor and equipment, they look at in-house equipment reimbursed on an hourly rate. They look at force account labor and force, and force account equipment, and that's sometimes your, some of your contractors. And so you have to have your list of materials. You have to have your equipment rental. If you, all, these, all this paperwork has to go inside with that. Your contract laborer, you have to have all that paperwork because TNS did a lot of work for us when you know, the creek you know, washed out. We have our generators. We had to have make, model, kilowatt, runtime, as well as GPS locations. So we had to get all that together, as well as timesheets. <clears throat> and with that code, at least when we did a timesheet, we could put it into an Excel spreadsheet and then start you know, working our way of deleting areas that weren't under that fund code. So it, it kind of got a little time consuming, a little tedious. And then a list of our district equipment, and like I said, GPS coordinates on all sites, every single site. <clears throat> Excuse me, I lose my voice. Then FEMA has the schedule of equipment, and it's 20 pages long, and we have to look up our equipment based on its size, uh, cubic yards, it is a F-350, a 150, a VACCON, everything, because they have a certain code, and that gives us what, we, what cost that we can get back for the hours that we use that piece of equipment. So we had to go through that. And then on to the summary. You really can't see this one. But this is their summary that we had to plot out what the people, what each employee did. So I apologize. And this was just a small window of several pages. So you have the, the day and what the people were, were working on, what they were doing, the personnel, their job classification. You had to put in there how many hours they worked over time, how many hours straight time. And then you had to do, um, <clears throat> and then include the equipment and how many hours and that code. So that all had to go in there. Um, they send you all the forms. You just got to fill them out. Nothing but, about what they had for lunch, though. No, nothing let about me, that. Let me ask a question about that. I mean, uh, when you say they send us all the forms, is, is, um, is that something that we can use in the future when, if another, when another disaster occurs and then um, be yes. tracking it as we're, as we're moving, yes. as we're actually Yes, that is my doing thought it? because this way, oh, it's yeah. not as time consuming. Yeah. Our guys will have a folder, and it'll be pretty much a disaster folder. And they will end up pulling that out and then putting all their time in. Yeah, so some of the things we really had to go back deeper, you know, and uh, it was uh, go back and take a look, especially generators. Yeah. They're supposed to be checked daily. They wanted the hourly, daily hours. And are the generators, are, they're not on SCADA? Or? <clears throat> no, they're not. Not as far as one time, no. So up here was another section that finance had to help me out because they had to put in everybody's uh, fringe benefits. So I also did their time, the fringe benefits, to give them their um, benefit rate that had to go into their calculations. <clears throat> and once it's all filled out, I just gave her a list of every single employee that worked on the project so we didn't have to keep going back, you know, and have her um, have finance go back and look through it again. And this is just on the generators, just to show you how you had to set, set it all up. You had to put the generator, the equipment code that came from FEMA, who worked on it, and all those X's are the times and days. We also had to put in how many hours it ran. And so this one is not as complete as what the original got sent. It's just too big of a file, it wouldn't go in, just to kind of give you an idea of some of the work that had to go into that. <coughs> A real quick question. Are all sure. those generators ones that we own or yes, that we... Yes, okay. every one of them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> We're pretty good. We have a lot of stationary in place because of our tanks, our wastewater plants, our water plants. You've got to keep those going. Um, and then we, we have generators at every... Pretty much every, every yeah, major site. Yes. Yeah. And then we have portables for some of the smaller areas yeah. that you have a little bit long, longer response time. So... So here's the list of the projects that we applied for, and I'm just going to go kind of give you a brief outline of what they were, and then, so basically you had the first one, which I, I hope you can see it better on your 
you can't, I apologize for that. Blagan Road, which is, that was the washout for the creek. Um, and so that we had to install that, the I-beam. We did a lot of emergency work, bringing in the bridge and everything else. There was a Blagan Road Loman um, emergency tie-in where CCWD and TNS did that emergency tie-in of the new 3A line because when the bridge, when that, that creek got washed out, our old, which was being replaced by 3A, the 3A line that went in, 12-inch steel line, right. was exposed to all the debris. And since we had the fires the year prior, there was a lot of trees and, and brush and things like that that came down through there. <clears throat> so they did that emergency tie-in. That's when it was snowing. I've got a few <laughs> pictures for you that our guys have stayed on it and diligently worked to bypass that old line and go on to the new. Mm -hmm. And then still we had further washout that exposed even the new line, um, but the bridge was over that. So, The Station 21 in Copperopolis. Um, due to the heavy rains, the lift station couldn't keep up, you know, with the pumping. So we had to hire, not only did our guys go out and use our backhands and pump out the lift station, so did uh, Foothill Sanitary that we had to hire, and it was around the clock until the storm succeeded. <clears throat> so we were able to apply that as a project. Six Mile um, uh, Valacito. The lift station there had the same problems. We had to do some emergency pumping there as well. Um, Murphy's, Murphy's Drive project was withdrawn because it was a, deemed more of a county issue than ours. And we were told that if there's any, any money spent on our part, that we would piggy, piggyback off the, the county and charge them for it, and they would then turn it into FEMA. Moak River Diversion, that's a project still in process because we you know, there's still water running. We did do a little bit of diverting to allow water to get, but we have not had to go on to the Moak River this year. This is the first time, I think, since I've been here that we've not had to use the Moak because Bear would go dry. So Bear Creek was running and has, is still running. Let's see. Uh, the Bear Creek diversion debris removal was minimal, so there wasn't a cost for that. This is all these projects that we applied for, but we decided to withdraw because there wasn't, you have to have at least $3,200 in order to make this project a viable project. Big Trees 4 and 5, we had a um, tree fall, hit our power pole, snapped the pole. We were running on generator at Big Trees 4 and 5 storage tanks until we had that replaced and we had to work with PG&E. New pole had to be installed, 100 amp service had to be installed, and some wiring. So that took some time and that was some contracted work, some force account labor. Um, Copperopolis speed tank, uh, we were through that one because it was just a latch and it was an easy fix. Sequoia Woods Mountain Retreat was a washout um, of the Sequoia Mountain Retreat near the back of their office, which exposed our pressure line. And it, it did break. We were able to fix it, but they're in the process of putting all that dirt back and, and fixing it up and stabilizing that area. So we pulled it because they were working on it. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, Copper Office Lift Station 18 was included in the generators because it was all the generator and power failure. Um, Velocity Lift Station, they couldn't also keep up with the flow at times and we've had to pump there. So we were able to combine some of these projects so that the, the, the fees could, could be applied to that one. So it was generators, because there was three events, two in January and one in February. So we were able to, some of the generators were happening for all three events, we pulled those together. But I will tell you in my excitement of getting you the agenda item for it, I, I had a trigger finger. So you show that we have a total of $192,000 and we actually have a total of 162. So I just wanted you to be aware that we've applied for $162,000 <clears> in uh, disaster relief. Right. So hopefully Great. we'll see that. So when, here you when, go. when will we know? I'm not sure right now at this time because I know they're they are swamped and <coughs> we it may be backlogged it's because the gal that worked for me was element. being sent uh, somewhere else, and the P our project managers were their phone numbers were 202, so they were Washington phone numbers, so yeah. they're 
situated here. But you, Teresa, we did, you did sub submit these preliminary draft uh, reports that they gave comments on, right? I mean, right. We, we did, they have seen it, they did give comments and, and, we did and sign changes the final were made. Papers. Gotcha. So, I mean, we have every reason to expect that this is going to meet the requirements and be, be uh, paid. It's just a matter of question of when. We do have one of them, the, the um, Copper Cove, because we had to do some emergency discharge at our wastewater plant because our, well, it was Title 22 water because our pond was too high and we couldn't get it lower, so we discharged to waters of the U.S. We did apply for that. She said that may be sketchy, but she said, well, we're going to put it in there anyway, so you can always rebuttal. So we'll see where that goes. So just, just a couple of pictures, just of the debris. That used to be, you know, the crossing, the creek crossing for our guys to get to the um, White Pines barn. And so you see we've got an I-beam there. I mean, it's probably hard to see, but there's our old exposed line. Here's the old exposed line where we've got an I-beam and, and we've strapped it to just, just keep support. And in the very back, you'll see a gray area with a little bit of black, that is our main, that's our brand new Reach 3A main. And it was gravel packed, but because of the storm and the continued storm, it was washing things away. <clears throat> and there's the bridge that we got from TNS that we rented from them for a temporary bridge to get to uh, the White Pines Barn so our guys could get in and out of there and get their work done. And there's that emergency tie-in that uh, took a whole day and night and part of another to get the emergency tie-in put together. TNS and our field staff assisted with all of that. And there's kind of some of the conditions that they had to endure that day. That's basically it. We just wanted to kind of give you a snapshot of all the work that was involved so that we can try to reclaim some of this money that was spent during the emergencies. So this is only money that we've already spent that we're asking for uh, repayment on, and is that correct? <coughs> yes, but we'll, uh, Moak River is still outstanding because we have a, um, and that's, they are aware of that, that it, that's one of them that's outstanding because we're waiting for Fish and Wildlife to give us permission to do a stream bed um, alter, you know, alteration. Yeah, 1600 permit. Um, mm -hmm. On the Bear Creek diversion, um, the <clears throat> roads held, I mean, access has always been a challenge down there. Mm -hmm. Those roads held up okay, and I know we have communication challenges down there. Right. None of that stuff could no. possibly <clears throat> get thrown in. I mean, I know I'm stretching it, but. Yeah, um, well, we probably could have put the, the road, but um, some of it they look at, how was it before? Right. Put it back yeah. the way it was. So some of it was kind of iffy, you know. And we have a lot of projects, and we put a lot here on the table. We tried to grab and focus on every single one that we could. Yeah, and so. you don't want to jeopardize <clears throat> any, no. anything mm -hmm. by, no. okay. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an enormous challenge that the county's having to deal with, the post-fire and, and even yeah. from those emergencies, is what condition do, do they, you know, how much funding do they get? What are they allowed to improve the road to? And it, true, they're, they're, it's so strict as far as, making sure that it is as similar as possible to what it was prior to the incident, that uh, some of the stuff, you're, you know, they're saying, you know, that there's no base on this road. We, yeah. we have so many things we want to, just, just basic needs, but we're, yeah. they're not going to be reimbursed if we do it that yeah. way. So. Yeah. But, you know, I have to another say applaud the, the field staff, too, because they were diligent and working hard during those storm events, and so. I just had one question. Uh, did we come up with any category that wasn't on their chart? No. No. Everything. They pretty much have it all covered, <laughs> so yeah. Uh -huh. okay. well, now, now going through this, we're better prepared to do this in, in, yeah. in the future. I, I, I don't want to see a repeat yeah. Yeah. right away. <laughs> on a going forward basis, as right. you say, we have everything. We're learning from it, and as we go along, spreadsheets are being made, mm -hmm. something to make it easier for tracking time, tracking equipment tracking hours on the generators yeah. to make sure that that's all there. So we don't have to try to backtrack and try to recreate anything. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I want to just reemphasize this last picture. <clears throat> Guys, this was it. This was really it. You know, all of us were out there, Teresa, mm -hmm. the entire staff. 
This Which one are you? The conditions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm down you're the one, that, you're the one that took that picture from the car. <laughs> She's on the escalator. I just want to note that is we, we I guess you know Teresa and has this down to uh, polish to a point that now I think even Rural Water Association has asked you to give a teach a class on this to uh, to other agencies, right? To oh, give them a, wonderful. And put wow. something in their magazine. Oh, yeah. nice. So, nice. Because a lot of small, t this is intimidating to a lot of small systems. Oh, absolutely. With, with yeah. the amount of staff that they have. Uh -huh. So, uh huh. But if they can get ahead of the game and start putting out these forms and having them readily available, right. it's, just a sm it's just checking the box and filling it out. Instead of oh, well, that's wonderful. Well, it's, yeah, you know, it, yeah, it seems like that, that should be the standard deal is, you know, that you have a workbook, you know, to go from, and, and when, the, when the disaster occurs, the work starts, you know, before they declare the disaster, and, and it's, be, you know, when any time that's impending, we should be, you know, trying to get ahead of it. I mean, you would think that'd be a service that they would provide, you know, is your, is, you know, is your disaster handbook, and, and how do you track this stuff? Right, and they did send FEMA people out with us. And we sent some of our guys to take them out to the sites to, they want to see them. So definitely be prepared for the Stanislaus fire. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> what is the status of our hazard, hazard mitigation uh, plan? Yeah, our our plan, and, and uh, that's something that uh, Peter is is working on, and actually has gotten uh, proposals uh, for us to do that. I think the time frame on that, Peter, is what early next year to complete the. Uh, to complete the update of our plan. Good, good job, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Teresa. Yeah, for the uh, hazard mitigation plan update uh, that's due this uh, next uh, spring, um, I have some bids and I will actually be awarding that um, probably this week and get that started, um, which actually takes more coordination and getting everyone together for the uh, coordination meetings for evaluating the hazard since the last update. So, um, Who's everyone? Um, usually you end up you know, coordinating a lot with the county agencies and other utilities um, and other folks as well. There was a group that was created, I, I, gosh, I can't remember the term, there's an acronym for it, but it's a, essentially a, a group that looks at this hazard mitigation plan. So we'll have to go through our contacts and try to update that again and, and, and try to get everyone in the same place all at once. And then you kind of rank hazards and revisit things since the last time. Not to expand too far on this, but uh, is, is this something that we're doing in cooperation with Calaveras County? Um, is it an opportunity for, for some cost sharing? Because um, the hazards are the same, but they do their own plan. They, um, whether or not they're up to date and such is another story. I think maybe they are now, but I know in the past they've, they haven't had a disaster uh, mitigation plan and failed to get some uh, funding because of it. But is, that, is there an opportunity for So that? they just updated theirs and it was behind schedule and it was actually required so that they could start to get some money for the Butte fire uh, recovery. Um, I did send the um, request for bids to the same person that did the county's plan, but to the extent that we can, I think we can utilize the fact that theirs is really recently updated to um, help with our plan um, in the long run. So, okay. and it helped help cut down the costs there too as well. I mean, it's a great idea. If there's any, if there's a, it makes sense at any point to to try to, you know, it join. It would be great to sink, so the, we could, to sink to sink the five-year plan. I, I believe so. Is that right? yes. Every five it, years. It'd be interesting to try to sink it. Yeah, maybe yeah. the next five years. I guess. Yeah. We should try. Yeah, you're right. We should try to just go ahead and do it. Yeah, because there's there's two things. There's a there's a multi-hazard plan, and I don't think that they did that last time. There's you can do like a multi-hazard um, plan. It's like multi-jurisdictional plan, which that could actually work out and everybody could have some some integration into that. Yeah, so. I just don't see that, I don't see that they're, they're probably, you know, other than the cover letter in the final page, they're probably gonna look pretty darn similar. You, yeah, you're right. Yeah. You know, all right. Yeah. Okay. And, and with that as well, we, you know, and they, of course having that updated plan is necessary to be able to file, to apply for expense reimbursement like, like this and what we presented, but also to, to go after the hazard mitigation uh, project funding that are projects that meet the intent of the plan. And so that's one that, and I got to give a lot of kudos to, to Charles and Joel who over the last week uh, worked late nights and in the weekend to get that application out for our Redwood tank replacement project. So that has been submitted to FEMA and hopefully we'll uh, have more funds coming. Okay. Right, I just want to make sure that when 
everything's published about, you know, the uh, emergency and whatever publications that the directors get to see how CCWD is being highlighted. All right. Anything else on that item? Any other questions for Teresa? <laughs> 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 Uh, old business is nothing to report. Item six, general manager's report. Yeah, just to note a couple of things. One, I, as I mentioned in the in the memo, the the work is underway for the Rancho Calaveras system and dealing with the uh, the problems with uh, the line breaks and uh, and high pressure and uh, coming out of the, the meeting that we had uh, recently with the direction that we received from the board to uh, to, to put everything we have in the resources, staffing and uh, capital resources in the R and R plan to try to try to really uh, turn the corner on this stuff. And uh, so that's happening. Our, our staff is organized um, across the distribution crews, not only in Jenny Lynn, but in, uh, in Copper, and, uh, and then our collections crews as well, and our construction crew are working together. They plan projects through the remainder of this year to really take out as many feet of this pipe, of the, of the worst of the, of the pipe down there in the distribution system as they can. Uh, that's underway, get, getting some real positive reports already. I think as of like today, even in a few days, they've taken out as much as 80, 80 feet of some bad pipe uh, and, and in areas that uh, have repeatedly leaked. So we, we really uh, are gonna do everything we can to, to really get ahead of this before the end of the year. And that'll be a continuing effort and priority. Uh, we also are gonna be coming to the board at, at, at the next meeting in December with a, with a uh, recommendation of award for the contract to install the P, uh, three PRVs to um, on our main line, water, water lines down there, high pressure areas to try to uh, help with that issue. And uh, we had, uh, as I noted, this was one that I was hoping that we would have the work all completed by the end of this year. But uh, what we realized is that to hire a contractor to get this done, our contract documents and our bidding process is tailored towards the big projects like 3A and the things that uh, you know, you want to have all of the bells and whistles in your contract documents and you want to have a very robust uh, bidding uh, process because it's, you know, multi-millions of dollars. Well, when we have something that's smaller that we're, we're really, you know, if you have make it too cumbersome and onerous, you actually can end up dissuading bidders or costing yourself a lot of money because they, they charge you a different price. So we're working right now, Charles, Teresa, uh, with Matt, uh, and, uh, and Sam are working to, uh, to develop that so that we have an expedited process and contract documents that we can use for this this uh, project and for others to follow because we want to we want to be nimble we want to be able to uh, do this much quicker and this there's going to be a lot more of these to come using um, what's remaining in the the R and R for the pipeline replacement uh, uh, work but really as we go into um, the next CIP update we're gonna we're gonna really try to maximize the uh, the use of, you know, really how do we best maximize using our internal resources, our staff, and, and as well uh, with outside contractors so that we can, we can get as much work done as possible. Uh, we had seriously thought about, you know, using our construction crew to, to do the PRV work, but the reality is it's really such a nice fit to have them uh, with the other guys down there working on the, on the service lines and taking those out. And so uh, I really don't want to, to distract from that effort, and I think that we can, we can treat the PRVs uh, separately and have it outside firm do that most, most expeditiously. So in any event, that's a high priority and it's moving forward. And we plan to have a town hall meeting down there probably in, in January where we can talk about this and some of the results that we're seeing with the cost of service study and those issues as well. Um, just a couple other things to note. Uh, I wanted to just to share with the board that at the finance committee uh, meeting in October, we did, uh, uh, Stacy and, and Joel did bring an item uh, to the committee to discuss the concerns that were raised at our, at our board meeting uh, in September by a, a, a landlord, a member, one of our customers in the Ebbets Pass community who uh, was really concerned about, you know, in the, in the situation where if you have a tenant who uh, you're trying to evict and they're continuing to incur bills uh, for utilities and liabilities uh, that could be uh, passed on to the owner, and then also the challenges of trying to actually fix somebody if, if they are continuing to receive those services. And so they, the request was looking at, look at our policies and see if there was something we could do to, to, uh, to improve that and provide better service to the property owner. Um, 
to the point that we're even some of the ideas where maybe we, we needed to have uh, access to the actual landlord tenant agreement so that we understood the relationship, we understood who was actually the responsibilities of each party and, and, uh, and whatnot. The, 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 at the end of the day, as the committee found and as the staff recommended, it's our existing policies, I think, go as far as we can given our staff resources and, and also the limitations that we have under, under California law. Uh, one of the things that we're, we're up against is uh, uh, under the California Civil Code, any, any uh, landlord cannot, uh, cannot intentionally uh, 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 seek to cut off your utilities uh, for a tenant so as to try to evict them or to use that as a means to, uh, to expedite uh, what is, by California law, otherwise a very lengthy and, and arduous process to go through an unlawful, unlawful detainer. So uh, we do definitely do not want to be in the middle of something that obviously is prohibited uh, by law. Um, and then as well, we do have our policy which allows the rolling over of $40 on a bill that can be uh, remain unpaid from bill to bill without termination of service. Uh, we, uh, we're, we're going to try to you know, use that in a, in a, in a very uh, prudent manner with this property owner when eventually they do complete the unlawful detainer process. And, uh, and and try to deal with the bill accordingly. But I, ju I just want to let you know that we we've, we've uh, dealt with that, and uh, and the committee uh, did feel that it was appropriate to uh, to stay the course with what we have in place. Uh, lastly, I just want to note that um, we have uh, uh, just just with the incoming new uh, president, vice president of Aqua, they uh, the president is making uh, decisions on who to appoint for committee uh, chair positions uh, at Aqua for the next. Uh, the next two-year term, and uh, I, I was asked, uh, I Brent Hasty, uh, I met with him this week, incoming president, and he asked me to chair the Federal Affairs Committee. So um, it's a real, real honor, and uh, I think it's a, a real positive thing for, for, our, for our agency and our region to have uh, not only the fact that, you know, I would be working, I, I have served for vice chair, but for some time, but I would have more direct interaction, particularly with the D.C. Aqua staff, who are just phenomenal and deal with a lot of the same issues that we grasp, grapple with um, in, in the work that Mia does. Um, but then as well, I, know I would also be sitting on the board of directors of Aqua as, as a chair of a committee. So that means that uh, you know, our region would have one more voice on the, on the board of 30, um, including the, the two that we have within our, our region three uh, chair and vice chairs. So I, I think that's a real positive thing. And that's all I have, thank you. Congratulations. On Thanks. That. That's good. Dave, I, I would like for you to, uh, to share, or maybe as I talked about uh, some of the uh, activities, the meeting that we had in West Point, because I think that that maybe uh, provided a different perspective on disadvantaged community concerns and the stuff that mm -hmm. I've been trying to work with that community all along, and I just kind of felt like, okay, now someone else from the district understands that a little bit better. Yeah, absolutely. That was... Uh as Director for Strange noted, we, you know, as part of our, our outreach that uh, particularly Joel and I have been doing um, across the, the, the county throughout our service areas with, uh, with stakeholders, with community leaders, with, uh, you know, members of the business community and, 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 uh, and others to try to uh, talk about the issues that we, you know, are dealing with financially, the things that were identified in the financial analysis plan, and, uh, and, and you know, really to, really to do that outreach, uh, you know, and, and use that information to, 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 uh, to have that time. Well, we, we had that meeting in, in West Point, and, uh, and, and it was uh, with members of the community. We had a, uh, a, a full house of, uh, you know, at least, uh, I'm guessing at least a dozen members of the community that were there. Uh, Director Strange was kind enough to join us as well. And, it, you know, it was a real eye-opener. I mean, it's, you know, the, you know the, these are, you know, they're, they're not easy meetings because, you know, in many, many cases they're issues that people have felt uh, need to be addressed for some period of time. They have serious issues they care about. And, uh, and so, you know, working through those, trying to understand them and trying to see if there's some way that we could find uh, a path that we can address them, that we can, you know, that there, maybe there's a room to take a fresh look at some of the things, the way we do business, some of our policies, why we, why we do what we do. And, if there's a way to meet our needs and still but provide a little better service and have some flexibility, then, then, um, then, then that makes a lot of sense. So I think we had that opportunity. We also got through a lot of the, the financial challenges. And, uh, but, it, but really, those issues about the disadvantaged community and you know, we even had a long conversation about uh, you know, the constraints and the, poten but the potential opportunities on uh, something in the way of a lifeline rate 
what the state is looking to do, what may be uh, an alternative pathway that maybe could be more discretionary by local agencies. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, there, there's, there's, you know, I think the best thing to come out of this is we're going to, uh, we've now organized this group, we're going to be meeting with them on a continuous basis, and we plan to be back within the next month or two to continue these conversations. And I think once we get information for the cost of service study, that's going to be really uh, helpful for us to, uh, to continue that. But, um, you know, bottom line, we want, we want people to know that we're, we're being completely candid and upfront about what we're, the issues we're dealing with and, and what the potential options could be and trying to be creative and, and exploring all options. And, uh, and, and so I, I think that, uh, you know, it's, again, it's not easy. There's still, you know, some things that uh, will take time to try to work through. But I think people do at least, I, I hope they can appreciate and appreciate, appreciate the fact that, you know, we don't have another agenda. We seriously care about what their, what their opinion is and, and how they, um, how they view these issues. So I, I know the feedback is incredible. Uh, we've already gotten some ideas through these efforts that are things that we're going to be, uh, you know, all kinds of different ideas, things that we're going to be putting in place, recommendations we'll be bringing to the board um, on things, changes, changes in the way we do business that could save us money or make us more efficient. So uh, again, that's just going to keep going. And if, if any of the board members have any other uh, groups or individuals that you would like for us to uh, to reach out to, please let us know, and uh, me or Joel, and we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Good, thank you. I think one of the biggest things that was obvious to me, um, because we were talking about potentially needing to increase the rates of sewer and some of those issues to these folks, is there are so many misconceptions. There really are. I mean, their thought is, oh, now we have to pay for the entire upgrade ourselves within our little community. You know, they didn't understand it was shared amongst all the sewer users, you know, throughout our districts. And, you know, little things like that that just seem to calm folks down, having, you know, educating them well, on I that. Think, I think the most important thing, particularly for that area, is the, is the fact that, that, uh, that if we don't have enough income generated, right. we're going to lose millions of mm -hmm. dollars in opportunity that yep. uh, directly serves them. They know that. They know that now. Um, but but my comment, I guess, is really one that is more wide-reaching, I think, in that as we hold these workshops throughout our entire districts, just know ahead of time going in that education is going to be so important to, to really, you know, address those misconceptions. They're out there. Be prepared for them, you know, as a game plan going in, and I think it'll be a much better meeting. No, that's a great, great observation on that on that subject. It sounds like a good opportunity to have board reports. <laughs> this is any other conversation. Let me finish my, my sentence and then go to that. I, I noticed that in our last in our last rate study in our town, town hall meetings that we held back then, and that was a that was a big thing. It, it, education is, it was huge. And then and then it, once you are trying to educate educate people, then there's then there's the matter of trust. Are they even trusting the education that you're trying to trying to give to them? Good observation. <clears throat> Go ahead. Okay, now that, uh, now now that like we've skirted story. the Brown Act and might be in the newspaper, <laughs> let's uh, move on. Okay, uh, board reports. Uh, Director Underhill, since you were so good during this whole thing. <laughs> Great. Um, <laughs> one of the handouts at the uh, McCallamy River Association meeting was this uh, team, this uh, the forest. The uh, Cal group. M team. Mm -hmm. Did you get a copy of this, Dave? I, the, no, not of that. Not of that handout. Oh, these I, are the members of, of the Cal. I definitely like that yeah. M team. Yeah. So, uh, I think that everybody should get a copy of this. This would be great you if bet. I could have mine back. I'd and, appreciate it. And you had suggested that we we agendize a uh, presentation from that group here uh, right. as well. And I think that's a, that that would that would be great. And maybe some of the projects that we're working on together with and the applications we file for grants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this was an interesting article that I picked up in that uh, San Francisco Chronicle. <laughs> Forget the fight over tunnels. Now it's water data disputes. <laughs> and this is, you know, this is was very interesting, and I wanted to bring it to you so that you can see that. Okay, um, pretty quiet up the hill. Now that um, we've gotten 3A, and again, I want to thank each and every one of the, my fellow board members for joining me, us, mm. at the uh, ribbon cutting. I thought that, that was, was great. just that was so good. special. And I have gotten nothing but compliments on the entire affair. 
It was just so professional <laughs> and, and so glad that you had three pop-ups because that would have been a killer that day. That it, was, there. it was hot. And so that was perfect timing. And again, thank you very much for everyone who joined and, and had input on my ribbon, my ribbon cutting. <laughs> All right. Okay. You did a great job on the ribbon cutting, by the way. <laughs> Director Thomas. All right. Um, gosh, there, the meeting that I went to this morning, and, and Peter was there, and, and both of us were chomping at the, at the bit to try to, to move things along. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a classic example of, of that old saying about we're a person stands on any particular issue is, is is directly in relation to where they sit, and so there was a guy that dominated. The, uh, his, his name is um, uh, Dante Namalini, and, and he he, <laughs> he had he had objections about the cost share uh, breakdown that the staff had recommended that would be shared by all the agencies, and I think I touched on this before, and, and I'm I'm not going to get in any kind of a brown act. A violation here, but but um, because we, as a uh, uh, geographically, are removed from the Central Valley, we do not, never have contributed to a, an area called Zone Two, and which which is a taxing mechanism, and this Zone Two is contributing four hundred fifty thousand dollars toward the cost of doing the um, this uh, grant proposal that will pay for um, the consultants to do our groundwater sustainability plan. Okay, um, so as you, as you look at, at the cost sharing proposal uh, that staff came up with, everybody is gonna be paying 11,664 spread over three fiscal years, I think, uh, potentially, or two. Uh, $11,664 is the average. We, however, because of the fact that we were never a participant in this group that is or contributing 450,000, our rate is proposed to go to 39,789. So we uh, argued about this back and forth, or we didn't know, we, we weren't participating in the arguments, but um, uh, there was a, an item that we were expected to, to come back to our respective boards and uh, seek a concurrence from these respective boards that we are in agreement with this cost share thing. We can't do that today because it's not an agendized item. So when I, when I stepped out to, to talk to Dave and to Peter about was you know, how, what kind of a mechanism could we possibly consider putting into place that would allow us to uh, I don't know, uh, ask our board if there are any objections to this and then we'll agendize it for the, for the next meeting, and so that we can at least report back to the people that are, are trying to move this, this uh, operation along on a timely manner. Um, you know, I'm, I'm open to a suggestion on this. I hate to, to have, have our, our hands tied. And, I, and is there, is there uh, an opportunity to have this as an uh, engineering committee or, um, or executive committee or something? Because I, I certainly would have some uh, opinions about about this, and and I've been involved in the formation of the Upper, Upper Macaulay Watershed. I remember very similar things, uh, uh, how it all came about. So I definitely have some opinions, and I hate to see this go so far that uh, that we end up just objecting, objecting to the whole process. Because we won't have time when, when, when we come meeting? together, uh, full oh. board. Um, right. Right. The, the next meeting will be scheduled on uh, December the thirteenth. Mm -hmm. so, well, personally for me, I'm not going to vote on anything I don't know anything about or, or I feel like I don't know enough about. <clears throat> yeah, and, um, and we, we don't even have an agenda item to, I, I would say, and as, as I recommend, it, why don't, we'll go back and, and probably chat with Matt and see what the best, the best venue for, if it could make sense to have some kind of a standing item related to the groundwater uh, effort or um, should we use the, the committee, but we'll make sure, and, and, and I think given the timing of this item, I don't think, um, I think we'll be okay given where the group's going, so we'll, we'll make sure we find some way to get it back to the board in a timely manner before. I have no before. problem with a special meeting too, whatever it takes, because this is really important item. Yes. 
if, if, if he needs to report back to, to the groundwater, groundwater sustainability um, meeting, which is, again, prior to our next meeting. Right. We don't have a meeting between now, now and then. We, um, you know, a special meeting might, might be the way of, of doing it and getting an education and discussing that. Yeah. We do have a finance committee meeting scheduled for Tuesday, November 21st at 10 a.m. Could there be a, if you need a special meeting, could there be a special meeting immediately following that? When was that, Tuesday the 21st? Yes. You know, yeah. I and I don't think we necessarily need a full board action before the 13th of December. But but what might be helpful is to have it on the agenda for that that finance committee meeting, if that's uh, for, for if next that's if the board would like uh, would like to do that, and then we can incorporate that into the information we bring at the 13th of December. Well, how about there be an educational component to this, so that you can bring me, so I know what it is that we're voting on and the 30,000 ish number and all that stuff well, to the degree that we can. Yeah. It, it, what I should have, have, what I should have mentioned it. here is that, that this 39,789 isn't, isn't exclusively CCWD's responsibility. It's going to be shared now by uh, Stanislaus County, CCWD and the county that, that they'll all be doing their one third, one third, one third, this small little rock Creek thing there, they're they're along for I don't want I don't want to say for the ride necessarily but they they're they're not either uh, contributing to the problem or the solution they just don't want to be left out of the process mm -hmm. so I, my my sense as far as you know, the education that I've gotten so far out of this thing is that we have the op the opportunity to do all this ourselves I mean, we could hire a, a platoon full of attorneys and and uh, grant writers and and all kinds of stuff and it would cost five times this thirty nine thousand dollars to even you know submit half an application so we, we, we've got a lot to gain and very little to lose by participating in this cost share formula that's my opinion so. it seems like we should be able to have a standing uh update on the gsa formation on our agenda i don't know why we wouldn't be able to do that okay that's, yeah that's we'll, we'll, def we'll definitely talk to matt and see what the what I, I i think uh what uh uh, Director Thomas was saying, uh, he said uh, our, our share, and it's, it's actually the east side GSA. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not just CCWD's share uh, as 39,000, it's, it's that group. But, but anyway, I think we should find a way to get this uh, before us, before this thing's uh, adopted. Because eventually our board's gonna vote to adopt this or not. And, and uh, the cost sharing, and not, not just of you know, the formation and stuff, but I mean, there's, there's significant project costs that, that are going to occur they're going to be you know very very expensive you and, know and the education i think is is important i'd like to understand what the eleven thousand dollars is that everyone else is paying and who and how that that formula came up is that being split equally amongst four or five different groups so but before we go any farther with the conversation i would highly recommend we, yeah. we wait till we have this on the agenda and you know, channeling that here i'm thinking probably probably should do that all right anything else uh, Okay. Director Strange. Um, I really don't have a lot to report, although last time I mentioned the surgery on my uh, rotator cuff, look at that baby. And that's pretty good. Because I know you're all very concerned. <laughs> but at the same time, yeah, that went really well and definitely recommend it. But it was mostly bone spur. It was no real heavy duty ligament damage after he opened it up and got in there. Um, but uh, we talked uh, quite a bit earlier, David mentioned about the meeting in West Point. Again, I think it really it went real well. We've discussed uh, that already. Um, one of the new things that was just brought in front of me today that I'm very, very concerned with has to do with the uh, O'Connell and Dempsey report on a new Malona study and funding efforts in our neighbors uh, and how they're, you know, the, the potential impact of their perception or their uh, stance on this issue and so I don't know if that's a closed session discussion that we need to have or, or what but uh, I really feel like we need to start gathering uh, strategies on how to move forward uh, knowing Congressman Denham's perspective on that now that's just kind of all I'll say to avoid any sort of Brown Act stuff or whatever 
You bet. And, and I'd be happy to but talk with you offline. I, I've had a, uh, actually had a conversation with reclamation staff today, so I can give you the oh, latest on that. Okay, perfect. Um, that, that's my big concern that I, I'd like to be able to address real soon, and maybe you, um, your statements will relax me down a little bit from that. <laughs> that's all I have to say. Director <laughs> Adam? Um, I just want to announce the cancellation of the camera meeting, uh, in, which was being held in December because it's a rel relative uh, uh, to the holidays. Uh, to, uh, it's been canceled, so there's no meeting on the tw on December 20th. Mountain County's uh, uh, November 17th meeting has also been canceled. It was supposed to be held at TUD on November 17th, but it's been re rescheduled to January 19th if anyone's interested at TUD. Mountain counties, right? That's all I got. Okay. I have uh, no surgeries to report. Oh man! <laughs> no barking dogs or anything. No the neighborhoods doing good though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I have nothing to report. Uh, we will be adjourning into closed session. Is there any public comment on our closed session agenda? Mr. President, just a note on the future meetings uh, that we we may ask the board to uh, to call a special meeting before the end of the year. Uh, if we, uh, depending on what happens with the pretreatment project at Jenny Lynn, uh, we're, right now we we have open bids. We've got construction bids open, and we're ready to go on on entering into a contract with the manufacturer to have the uh, the, the equipment uh, 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 manufactured. And uh, but all of that is pending completion of the environmental review by FEMA. Uh, we've been in close contact with uh, with our our project manager at Cal OES, uh, who's been great and uh, is is doing everything he can to, to move that forward. And uh, but in any event, if we get if that breaks free and we get and we are we're able to move forward on that, uh, it may be uh, it may be uh, beneficial for us to try to do that in advance of even the, the December 13th meeting. So. We'll, we'll keep you posted if anything anything okay. happens there. All right. Um, seeing no public comment in closed session, we will adjourn the closed session. Mona. Can you um, <laughs> 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 And then he, he, it was funny, he walked in saying, gosh, nobody hardly shows up at this meeting. Now he knows why. Yeah. <laughs>